right now. And here's Tina Kelly, ladies and gentlemen. Hello, everyone. How are you? Thanks for being there. Um, thanks for having the camera on if you're comfortable. If not, I get it. And um, should I just start with my usual shtick about writer's block? Sure. Yeah. And, you know, I, I kind of told you about Tina, guys, but I, I didn't give you really any introduction in the last class. And, and that seemed to work really well. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so go uh, ahead. Uh, let me just, I'll, I'll say this, and I'm going to try my heart to keep my mouth, try the hardest to keep my mouth shut, which is really hard. But please take notes, guys. These are from, you know, the last class. I wrote down a lot of stuff. So just write as much as you can and that's it. Okay, so we are recording. Awesome, okay, great. Well, um, first off, let me let me explain where I am in my career right now. Um, I was um, a journalist for newspapers for um, from 1989 till 2009. And then um, I took the buyout from the New York Times in 2009 to write books. I wrote a book about homeless young people and I wrote a book about a transformative high school model that came out in June. And I was working on a book um, between May and November with a co-author that I was excited about, but they decided that they were too busy to continue with the book. So now I am um, looking for my next big thing. It's a setback temporarily and um, not the first time, not the last time that this will happen. So um, I've had other book projects fall through and I'm hoping that there are good things ahead. But just to let you know that even at this stage in a career um, that has been a, a nice career, there's still setbacks and there's still disappointments and it's just kind of the lay of the land. So um, I am looking for freelance assignments and working on um, actually two or three things popped up just last week, uh, which was encouraging. So um, I don't mind doing a whole bunch of little different projects. And sometimes that makes me happiest because working on one file for weeks at a time, like you do with a book is, is a little hard for someone who has um, a little bit of a twitchy brain, <laughs> like I do. Um, every time I do a class for John, one of the most common questions for, from everybody is how do I deal with writer's block? And the way I deal with writer's block is basically, oops, um, it's basically I don't believe in it. I don't give it power. I think most of the time what people call writer's block is more of, I hate this assignment and I'd rather be eating a ham sandwich than working on this paper for my professor. That can lead to what feels like writer's block, but writer's block itself is like a kind of a diagnosis, a, 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 a very clinical um, debilitating thing. And I, and I think I can't imagine it happening. It would be so devastating to me to not be able to write that I, sort of plug my ears and go la, 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 when people talk about it, I find that deadlines are, because that way I'm not giving it power over me. Um, I find deadlines are the best antidote to any sort of block that you might have. And I have found in, in my career, the ability to meet deadlines uniformly has really helped me avoid writer's block so far. Um, if something is due and I agree to that deadline, then I've sort of given my word as a human and journalists in particular are very bad at lying. Um, if we lie frequently, we will be unemployed frequently. Hold on a second. Sorry, that was my cell phone. Um, we will be unemployed pretty quickly because you're only as good as your word as a journalist. And if I promise a deadline, then I'll make the deadline. And that clarity sort of keeps the demons away. Um, I've used that at the New York Times. I would never miss a deadline. It just seemed like it would be the end of the world for a paper like that. Although what I heard in my interviews was that it was actually kind of unusual to make all your deadlines all the time, which surprised me. I thought, oh, at this level of journalism, everybody must be making their deadlines all the time. But 
but someone said, no, you're noteworthy for how you always make your deadlines. And that very much surprised me. Um, another thing um, that I realized from discussions and questions about writer's block is a way to avoid that feeling is to make sure that you're at your best. Um, you can't really write without your body working well. And so to the extent possible to avoid drama about writing in my own head, I try to keep myself in the best shape uh, mentally and physically. So for me, going for a run in the morning is almost a performance enhancing drug for me. The, the runner's high, the serotonin that comes after the dopamine rush, whatever, um, helps me feel more focused, feel more cheerful, feel way less broody. Um, the days that I have gone for a run are the days that I write best. Um, for some people that might be a walk in the woods, a walk along the shoreline, a, a yoga session, a kickboxing session. But as you grow into adulthood, you'll know what makes you feel best. And that doing that and taking care of yourself physically is a really good way to be a better writer. Um, I find that it requires a lot of sitting down to be a writer and that's not good for you. So um, I break up my day into Pomodoro moments like John Schwartz probably talked to you about where you work for 25 minutes and then get up and putter for five just so long as you you know, walk around to get the blood moving again, do some push-ups, clean the cat box, whatever it is. I have a list of chores um, that I will do in five minute chunks every 25 minutes, which makes me write much more effectively. Um, yeah, and just, just to, re <clears throat> to remind you guys, not Tina, um, when she said John Schwartz talked about, she's referring to the essay, the, the article you read called Learning How to Learn, Rewiring Your Brain. At the end, it talked about techniques like first, you know, understanding, you, do you have a hiker brain, do you have a race car brain, whatever, but talked about the Pomodoro technique which just refers to what these these timers look like tomatoes. That's the Italian word for tomato. Oh, tomato. okay. Yeah, but yeah, just it's so much. I mean, we've seen it. You know, with my students, time management is a real issue, especially you know they're in college, and it's a whole different set of repression coming down. It's not high school where high school. I said this to somebody at Columbia High School. I said high school really prepares you well to go to prison. <laughs> you know, they teach you about going, getting detention for things and the bell ringing, but it doesn't do that much for college, you know, so you have to kind of do it on your own without, you know, you're not being punished and you have to do it internally. So anyway, that's my little spiel there about that. So that, that's the way that, that keeps me going and keeps me just feeling, you know, you don't always feel accomplished at the end of a day of writing, but if you've done six little chores in your Pomodoro moments, then you at least feel like you've got it done. You know, you might get a draft in, but it might be completely blown up and redone by the time your editor's done with it. But at least you've got, at least I've got a clean sink and the dishes put away. Uh. Um, the, um, let me see. I want to go down your questions that John sent me ahead of time so that I get hopefully a little bit um, from everybody. Oh, this is a new one. Um, this is from, hold on, from Neha. What was a significant failure in your life, writing related or just in general, that helped you evolve? In other words, how did you overcome this failure? Um, I would say, and I don't know if John's even heard this, but um, taking the buyout from the Times was was painful. It was, um, there were two buyouts that year where they offered to the newsroom, like, we will give you money to leave. And um, they needed to get 100 people from the whole paper in the second round that year. It was the nine during the Great Recession. In the first round, pretty much everyone felt they'd probably be okay. The second round, nobody really felt safe. 
and I'd gotten a review that wasn't 100% glowing. I'd been working very, very hard in a hyper-local blog called The Local, where I was running basically a, an online publication with um, amateur writers that was supposed to be meeting time standards. And I didn't really have a lot of training in how to be an editor. And I was working from about 7.30 in the morning till 12.30 at night. And they still managed to fault me for not doing journal um, investigative reports from the town and in not going to night meetings. And I felt like I was working pretty much every hour except for dinner time. Um, and I had younger kids at the time. And it felt like, wow, you know, I, I probably should get out before I get pushed out. Luckily, um, so that was a hard period of getting a negative review, but luckily there was someone who I knew from writing about who was looking for a book writer to co-write a book with, and that was um, Kevin Ryan at Covenant House, the shelter for um, young people experiencing homelessness. And I'd always wanted to write a book. It was on my bucket list. And to get hired by him, um, kind of on staff, it was on staff with benefits and everything to do um, my life's goal felt like a real blessing. And my plan B was suddenly better than my plan A. Although I still feel like, oh, was I good enough for the times? You know, did I, would I have lasted longer? I don't know if I would have lasted longer, frankly, because they let people go um, in the following rounds of buyouts who I felt were, you know, even more qualified than I was to be a reporter. So it was a very tough time in journalism. And, and I still sort of take that a little bit as a failure, um, even though it worked out okay at the end. Okay, but and yet, can I just say that the, in reading William Zinser's article, College Pressures, he talks about people like you going exactly through that experience and ending up doing something really positive and you never know. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, so that's, it's good for these guys to hear that from you, which I, yeah, I'd never heard this. Well, I, I remember my mom saying, like, are you sure going to write a book on homeless kids is, is a great choice? Because what about what's your job security? And I said, you know, journalism job security right now is not looking all that good either. Um, and I'm very glad I, I did that project. It was really a, a joy um, through and through. And it led to, you know, another book and hopefully more in the future. So um, it's scary out there and you have to take risks and you know, I'm looking now as to what's next, and I'd like to write a nonfiction book, but I don't quite have a topic to pitch right now. So I'm mulling around how best to put food on the table. And there's a poet in residence at the Guggenheim Museum position that's open to apply for. So I'm going to do that because um, I'll, I'll put my hat in the ring for that. And I'm looking at a number of different, very unusual and different choices. So as one of my friends said yesterday, you sort of lay the tracks for a number of different options and see which one actually starts to move in the positive direction because I care about biodiversity and there's a job in that field to apply for as a, um, you know, as a spokesperson for the Center for Biodiversity Studies. There's working as a, you know, I, I, I'm interested in homelessness issues and I could do something with tiny houses for the homeless off the grid and try to get that in a particular town or try to make that more of a movement. I'm, I've just been doing a lot of brainstorming and it feels like a fruitful, creative time. I'm trying to stay cheerful about it, even though it wasn't my choice to be looking for something right now. Um, sh let me look down for more of your questions. Do you have any other writer friends and how do they help you become a better writer? That's from Emily. Um, oh yeah, for sure. And um, I have, um, my best friend in the world is a writer for, um, or an editor now at NPR for climate studies. And she's always holding me up to be my best self. She's never, settling for less than awesomeness because that's how she is in her own life and she holds me accountable and calls bs on particular projects that don't use my skills in the best way or you know tries to keep me on track and cheerful 
And I also um, highly recommend, if you hear nothing else from me than this today, is to have some writing buddies, somebody that you can share your drafts with. For me, um, when it's nonfiction, I, I send it to usually my first readers are my in-laws. Um, they're retired professors and they have some free time and they're supportive. And usually they give very good feedback about, you know, you're not being clear in this section or I don't think that's interesting over here or how do you make it better here? Do you miss, like, I often tell stories in the wrong order. My husband will catch me on that and say like, you know, you need this information at the beginning so that people understand what you're talking about. And um, it's very important for them to have your best interests at heart and for them to be kind, but also smart. So look across your classroom. You might find somebody who you can share your drafts with, look in your family and friends, um, aunts and uncles, what have you. There, there should be, you know, there's writing tutors available. Nobody gets it right the first time. Um, I, I am a big fan of shitty first drafts, pardon my French, but that is Anne Lamott's term. She's a brilliant writer and a brilliant coach of writing. Um, in many of her books. And she just talks about how nothing, you know, if you get it down on paper, you have something to work with. You can forgive yourself for it not being brilliant the first time. Nobody's brilliant the first time. And I learned this anew this year. Um, I don't know if any of you follow poetry or have read um, The Art of Losing by Elizabeth Bishop, which is a beautiful poem about a woman just sort of mulling over all the things she's lost in her life and how she's gotten good at practicing it. And she's just gotten to be a better loser over time. And it wraps around to losing a person and it's very moving. Um, it's one of the more famous, I think it's a villanelle or a, it, it's a fancy hard form and it's sort of the gold standard. It's a beautiful poem and maybe John will put it up on the screen for you sometime. Um, I haven't talked about this before because it's a new revelation to me, but there's, an article or two about the original, the like 20 drafts that that poem went through. And the first draft, I would have kicked out of my journal. Um, it was just boring and a, a laundry list of things she'd lost over her lifetime. But she workshopped it, she refined it, she turned it into this profound piece of literature. And I thought, ah, oh, well, who knows what might be lurking in my shitty first drafts file or my journal file. I, I keep a journal. I've kept a journal since I was 14. Um, I've missed some days in there, but not, not many, not more than a couple of weeks. I think I kind of just did notes during the first couple of weeks of the pandemic because it was overwhelming. And I think I missed a week in high school, but um, that's where I get my practice. I get practice putting sentences together. I write down words that are new to me and collect them. I write down stuff I might throw in a poem someday. I write down overheard conversations, what's been going on with my family, what I had for dinner. And it's probably really boring to read, but it's wonderful to get practice. Like a pianist would practice piano. I practice writing when I write in my journal. Uh, I really recommend it for y'all. It is actually good for your health. There have been studies showing that people who journal for 20 minutes a week, which is nothing, who have a chronic disease like diabetes or um, some other chronic diseases would become healthier after journaling for just 20 minutes a week about their condition. It focuses the brain. It lets me, if I'm angry at something or pissed off during the day, I'll just run over to my journal and moan about it um, and then sort of feel like I've cleared my head of distraction and bad energy and just go on to what I was working on otherwise. But keeping a journal is healthy for you. It's good practice and it's actually hysterical to reread when you're old and go back and want to see what life was like for your high school student and you reread your own junior year in high school and realize how much has changed. So I've done that recently with my kids. Um, 
And also, guys, feel free to raise your hand or put something in the comments if you want to follow up on that, um, on any of the questions that I'm addressing. Um, oh, OK, so Michael asked what type of edits had to be made to make your book much better. The sad truth on that was pretty much not much. Um, both cases, we handed in the book. The first one was Almost Home. The second one was Breaking Barriers about a high school program that lasts six years and gives students a free associate's degree. Um, my co-author and I would hand it in on the due date because I believe in deadlines and didn't get much feedback back from the editors. And it blew me away because every article I've handed in has had serious editing, you know, people want to make themselves useful. And if your title is editor, you're putting yourself out of a job if, you, if you're not making comments and improvements in the piece. But these book editors didn't really ask for much different. Um, I got a page of notes back from the editor at Wiley for Almost Home. And I don't even think we got that much from Teachers College Press. And my, our agent for Almost Home said, you know, it's sort of the lay of the land right now that editors don't really edit. They spend more time acquiring manuscripts. Um, it was disheartening because, you know, this is these are my first two books. And I thought I can get it as close to good as I think. I'm not going to hand in something until I'm proud of it. But um, I thought they would take it to the next level and make it book excellent, not just, you know, whatever we could do excellent. And um, that didn't happen. Um, particularly for the Covenant House book, we had sent out each chapter to experts in the fields that either of us knew to make sure that we were on the right track. So I didn't do that so much with the second book. Um, so it's a bit of a disappointment. I'd like to have gone through that process. But then I also realized financially, if you go through a giant edit that requires a whole second draft, then it's not like they're paying you more for that. You still get the same royalties and the same, you know, advance. So I would be earning much less per week if they required 10 weeks of editing. So maybe it was all for the best. But with regular editors at magazines, um, there's a lot more back and forth and a lot more, you know, oftentimes I've found that the editors make the final product much better and much easier to read. Um, uh, Stephen asked, what was the most fun article to write about? And I don't know if John knows about this one, but I, when I was working, I think it was for the Seattle Post Intelligencer, I heard about a uh, Lutheran minister on the San Juan Islands, which are west of Seattle, northwest of Seattle, who sort of was a circuit minister like they used to have in the old days where there weren't enough priests to go around and the priests would visit different churches at different times of the day. Like they'd go by horseback from one church to another and go to an eight o'clock service and then a 10 o'clock and a noon. And so everybody had a little piece of the priest. Well, this, what, this guy was doing that only in his own airplane and he would fly from island to island. And then he'd have a little car at the airport, like a, a beat up old car that would just get him once a week from the airport to his church. So I got to go along with him that day and hear his sermon three times, but also see the amazing scenery of, um, of the San Juan Islands on a beautiful day in Seattle. And there have been many times in my journalism career where I felt like, oh, people would pay a huge amount of money um, on TripAdvisor, if they could have the adventures that I'm having, that I'm getting paid to do. So, you know, there have been trips on boats with naturalists, and I got to be kind of the fly on the wall for the Covenant House book on a reunion between a son and his birth mother. And the son hadn't seen his birth mother since he was four. So it was basically the first time they were reuniting. And I got to ride along in the car from Chicago to St. Louis, I think it was. Where did we go? I was, or Indiana, there were, 
it was like a five hour car ride and it was me and the kid and his mom. And that was profound. And the mom basically at the end thanked me for being there. And I thought, oh, it's the other way around. Like, I thank you for having me. And um, I think it made it easier for her because I was a little bit in journalism mode and talking to the son about stuff that I knew from his life, from interviewing him previously. And the birth mom kind of just got to hear us talking so she didn't have to ask the questions. And I think it, she did say it, it helped her when she was nervous, when we were at baggage claim waiting for him to show up. Um, and I was adopted myself at birth. So it was very interesting to see this happening in real time. Um, what else, what else? But those were some of the most fun articles and hopefully I can get a couple more that are, that feel like scams when you get paid for doing something that, um, that other people would pay to do. Um, yeah, so Tina, speaking of, of the whole adoption issue too, what they read, I, the, the article about, um, it was Joy Fisher um, yes. in the New Jersey. Oh, yeah. And what I did was I said, we're gonna read the beginning and the end of this. And the middle is kind of like the meat of the article, obviously. But could you talk about like the experience of writing that, why you chose to have the beginning and end with her and how, how you did the research for it? Like, you, you, did you ride in the car with her? Did you meet her at the church? But could you talk about writing that? Yeah, um, it's kind of a common trope in reporting just to start with like the uh, person who embodies the topic that you're writing about. So it's not that unusual to begin and end with your best material, your best interview. But Joy was very open when I talked to her um, first, I interviewed her at Lane's in a diner um, off of Route 22. And, you know, we had, I don't know, I think, I think I tend to have enjoyable, I hope to have enjoyable conversations when I'm interviewing somebody. So when I was talking to her, she knew that I too was getting my, um, my original birth certificate. So we had that in common. When I'm interviewing someone, I tend to ask all the easy questions first. So there's a rapport there. Um, and I find that people share stuff with me pretty freely. My husband's always laughing because we'll go to a party and I'll be talking to somebody in one corner of the room and getting like totally deep info just by asking kind of what I do for a living kind of questions. And um, I'll always have wonderful stories when I come home from a party and he's like, you have like this magnet in you somehow that gets people to tell you things. Um, I think it's because I I really find people fascinating and I'm polite and friendly and um, I'm very empathetic or I, I try to be. So Joy and I had a, a good interview, a good first interview. And then, you know, I knew that she was working on meeting her birth mother and she was from a she was raised in a family of singers and her birth mother was a singer and she was very involved in her church in Asbury Park. So it came about that she was gonna be meeting her birth mother for the first time at this church service. And I described that, I, that was in the article, right? The whole- Yeah, it's at the beginning of the article, yeah. The, the sermon that the mom mm -hmm. sort of gave about like, this was my joy. And the woman, her daughter was, was named Joy and it was very, moving and I was like I was cursing myself for having worn mascara that day because I was going to be a hot mess it was just very moving it was like I came home and I said to my husband it was like watching a movie except it was real life I mean it was it was one of those incredibly dramatic scenes where the birth mother is hugging the adoptive father and you know it was a giant reunion and it was it was like satisfying as a viewer as if I'd watched a really beautifully told story. So I was, I totally hit the jackpot on that instance that, that Joy was willing to let me into that. And that the birth mother didn't say like, oh no, I don't want any reporters there, that's creepy. You know, um, people are very lovely at, at I, as much as people hate journalists as, as they're one of the least popular professions like right after lawyers and such um, and politicians, 
I, I find that people have been very open in letting me into things that I might not in my own life have invited somebody into. Um, and when you were, and you know, back, to, because again, for those of you, hi, Mariam, you just came in. Hello. Nice to see you. Nice to see your box and your name in it anyway. <laughs> um, that, you know, you chose imagery in, in the writing of it that really just said so much more, you know, than than what was there. Oh, I forget. It, it was very concise. I, I yeah, right. But I, um, I should reread these things that you guys are reading. It was yeah. it was funny. Um, I think it was in this class. Somebody asked me what I thought of my own writing, which was a new question to me. Um, I don't know who it was, but I actually had to experience that question in my own life. I was applying for a job um, that involved writing about health. So I was looking back, health and family. And I was looking for, looking through my clips, my, my old stories, the ones that I've talked about for years, but hadn't really looked back on. And, um, and I realized that I, that I was proud of them. Like, when I left the Times, I didn't really feel like, oh, I hadn't hadn't won a personal Pulitzer. I hadn't done a giant project. I didn't have any clear body of work because I'd been a general assignment reporter so often. And I had little subbeats, but I didn't feel like, like Linda Greenhouse or Steve Greenhouse who would leave having covered the Supreme Court or labor or just had one specialty. So I was looking through some of them and I thought, you know, ugh, these aren't, these aren't bad. I mean, they, they had some flair and it made me proud. Um, and it was fun because there, there are two, actually, John, maybe for future classes, there's one about a woman who had had 163 foster children in the course of her life, not all at once, usually one at a time. And she was in her seventies and I guess widowed and it was her thing to take in foster babies. And she talked about another woman who had um, taken in kids at, into her 80s, but only until they were 12 pounds, because after 12 pounds, she wasn't comfortable lifting babies heavier than that. So very, very young infants. And I've always held that up as something that I would want to do in my retirement. Just from talking to her, I thought that's the biggest gift you can, if you can be a really good foster parent, um, what better way to spend your retirement? Babies are really cute and yeah, they keep you up at night, but old people can't sleep anyway. So you might as well be doing a good deed. And the other one was on a family where they were high school sweethearts, but the guy, even in high school had had his girlfriend, later his wife, go bra shopping with him. He liked to dress in women's clothes. And after they'd been married for probably 20, 25 years, the husband decided that he was to live his true life, was going to go through a sex change surgery and become a woman. And I had been covering civil unions and marriage equality um, at the time. And one of the advocates for that had told me like, you know, there are already two women living in a marriage in New Jersey and nobody bats an eye. So why don't you write about this couple where it was a, you know, a heterosexual couple at the beginning, but a homosexual couple at the end, at the end of their um, time together. And it was so fascinating. And I always talk about that to, to people whenever, you know, when I'm explaining transgender issues to my son or to anybody, I, I remember that story so well. And I went back and I reread that too. And it was, I just remember the coach, I don't think it got in there in the story, but the coach of the son, they had, they had three teenage kids and the, one of them was on the football team and the coach, and this was in Bergen County, had said, if anyone messes with this kid because of their family's um, situation right now, you are completely and immediately off the team. And I thought, ah, that is, that's good coaching. Um, but I learned a lot in the course of that article. So, uh, oh, so Asna asked, what would be some advice for us to become good writers? Um, I guess that's the whole point of my being here. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, let, me, let me just, I, I just want to interject something, this idea of you going back and rereading. 
one of the, the things and I, I've consented to you, but you know who Alice Siebold is, right? Read the Lovely Bones. Yeah. And anyway, I had I had used, and my students are going to be reading her essay that she wrote called Living with the Dead about 9-11 uh, Hurricane Katrina. And my sister is friends with Alice. And I, I sent her, I sent my sister an email saying, you know, tell Alice we're using her essay because I think it's the 9-11 piece. And Alice wrote back that she basically can't stand to read her own work and she has a really hard time it but because of, of me using this essay she went back and read it and said i actually realized that this is pretty good <laughs> but in her own head it was just like some dumbass in newark using her essay made her go back and read it and in her head she was carrying around this very negative thing of like oh i wrote this crap i don't the, the fact that it was in the New York Times, that, that didn't mean anything to her. Yep, yep, uh, yep. I mean, we're awfully hard on ourselves. And, um, and I think that's probably a little extra true for women. I think um, when I am coaching women writers, I often, more than with men writers, have to say, like, take that mean editor out of your head. Because whoever's telling you when you sit down, and this is true for everybody, I don't, I don't, mean to be genderistic about it, but I think it's more of a drama in some ways for women that you, when you sit down, don't listen to the little voice that's telling you it's crap. I mean, yeah, it's probably crap, but it's okay. It's a first draft. You write bad first drafts, you revise, but if there's a lot of negativity, like the little Jiminy Cricket or devil on your shoulder, that person is not good for your mission. And it might be an old boyfriend or a parent or a sibling or a teacher or a workshop mate who was hard on you, but they need to be exorcised. They need to be, you know, kicked off your shoulder, even for just the 20 minutes you're sitting down to write before your timer goes off and you can go do the cat box, but just keep that voice out of your head and realize that once it's down on the paper, it exists in the world and then you can work on it. It's like a lump of clay and it's, it should be honored and you should give yourself a little pep talk. I, I have a file of pep talks in my computer where I'll just like, when I'm feeling discouraged, I'll just go and read these corny but useful affirmations about how this particular project is gonna be awesome when it's done. And this is, you were meant to write this book and you're good at it. And you know, just whatever you need to hear, tell it to yourself. It's, it's just as good. if you. If you talk negatively about your writing, part of your brain hears that coming from outside and believes it. And that's that's not good for the mission. It's not right. It's not true. Um, Elizabeth Bishop wrote horrible first draft of the best poem, one of the best poems I've ever read. And just keep revising and it'll get there. So um, that's one piece of advice. Another piece of advice is to write a ton and read a ton because it's hard to get better without those two things. Um, you need to read, if you're submitting stuff to a magazine or a poetry magazine or a newspaper, you need to know what that publication likes. Um, I'm terrible at following this advice. I don't really like reading or listening to poetry reading so much, but I, I like producing it and I'm often sending out to publications where I haven't read the back issues and that's that's not useful. It's not, it's not, it doesn't help your um, chances of getting in. So if you read kind of the best of the best, that's, um, that's useful. The stuff that John is steering you to is really, really good. It also helps to read crappy stuff. Um, I was in a junior in college when I got a spring internship for a week at a publication where I got to read the slush pile. Um, mm, don't remember the name of it, started with a P, but I went in every day and read the, the slush pile is what comes in from everybody. It's, it's not, the, the, not the writing that the editors have said, please write us an essay on this topic. It's, it's just what comes in in the envelopes of um, anybody who's submitting essays and poems to this literary magazine and it was so instructive because I had been reading 
the canon in college. I had been reading like Milton and the Aeneid and all the classics and 100 Years of Solitude and just stuff that was bona fide brilliant. I didn't know what bad writing looked like, but when I read The Slush Pile, I did and I could see what needed to be fixed. It was, it was very helpful to look at it and say, oh, I get why this is bad. I get why this isn't gonna be accepted into this publication is because this is, a, this is stereotypical thinking or it's a cliche or it's just flabby writing. And to be able to recognize bad writing was so much fun after reading all these people who are known for centuries as being just the best of the best. So if you can read some crappy writing, um, it might be good for you. I'm sure it's not hard to find on the internet. I don't know where you would go, but to, to, to get a look at what's out there and is not good gives you a chance to practice your editing skills, which you need to use on your own writing. Um, Avian asked, um, are there any topics that you have written about that give you, gave you a hard time mentally while writing? And I talked about this a little bit um, at the earlier class. I remember the first time I was writing a college paper. Well, the, the answer is college papers. College papers were the hardest. Um, I was less likely to be excited about the topics. They were due, they were oppressive. I was getting graded for them. Um, I was always doing them at the last minute. I was in a kind of a honors program at college where it was a great books course and it was a paper a week and it was known for being kind of, it was called directed studies, but everyone called it directed suicide because it was so hard. I don't know why I took that challenge on. It wasn't awesome, but it was a paper a week and every Thursday night we'd be freaking out as a group writing these papers and, you know, it was really, really hard. Um, but what was the question? Um, oh, I, I started writing my papers, my first drafts on a keyboard because my handwriting was terrible even then. And then I would, I had this moment where I started believing the first drafts, the first sentences that I put down. And I thought, no, no, just because it's in print, in typeface doesn't mean that it's right. And it, it was this very challenging. I remember like, I think I pulled an all-nighter that night and I wasn't I was stressed out and I wasn't thinking clearly, but when I ever look at a sentence because it was in typeface, I thought, oh, well, it must be true because it looks like a book. And then I, it caused me difficulties in, in actually revising it. Those were some of the hardest things I've ever written and so much less fun than what I was able to write about my adventures out in the real world and my reporting junks and talking to strangers and learning their stories that just made everything so much easier. And it was directly for a, an audience out in the world. Journalism was so much more fun than writing for the academic world. Although in the academic world, that's where you get your skills down. So if you find yourselves not having a song in your heart when you're writing your assignments, that's okay. They're hard and they're, you're being judged on them and it's a skill building thing, but there is definitely a chance to have joy in your writing after you're done with academics. Well, <clears throat> to just let you know that maybe it's a little different or I have, I'm trying to make it a little different in my class, their book, yeah. Writing with Style by John Tremble, who describes a very similar experience in college to yours, but he advises write as if you're writing to a companionable friend and imagine yeah. an audience who is, who is your ally. So do you think that's good advice? Yeah, it's, it's great advice. I think John Trimble. John Trimble, yeah. I, I know his widow um, from Facebook, but she's a very famous, in the poetry world, she's a very famous. Um, I think you have a different person in mind. Um, was he from Midwest? No, he's from Buffalo. Okay. He's a different person. <laughs> no, because he doesn't have a widow. He's got two ex-wives. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. I th okay. No. That's all right. <laughs> um, back to questions from yes. the class. Um, so yeah, college papers were hard, but John's are probably way kinder. Um, ooh, Melvin asked, what was the favorite? Uh, 
the most emotional piece of writing I ever wrote, I only made myself cry once in my writing career. And it wasn't because it was so beautiful and profound. It was, I was writing about the loss of a friendship. And I've written about breakup poems. Um, I'd written breakup poems in the past, but this was about a, a roommate from college who I'm no longer friends with and what a loss that was. And I was just really crying during it. And it didn't go, I mean, I think I sent it to her, but she doesn't want to be friends. And it uh, surprised me that there was that level of sadness, even it was many, many years later. But I think, you know, and I don't know if the poem was particularly good. I think it probably wasn't. And a lot of the things that, like when Drew got his concussion, uh, my son had a concussion and I was very upset about it. And I wrote some angry poems about the situation. And they were, you know, some of my friends would say, it's a little too soon. You know, I don't think you're ready to write about this yet because you haven't fully processed it. And I think it was, there's some poems that I write that are just to get the emotion out. It's like a grief process. Um, and I don't judge them for being ready for awesome poetry magazines. I think it's just something that is a way that psychologically I process upset is by just writing poems about whatever it is that's getting me in a particular era of my life. But yeah, definitely that. And also Portraits of Grief obviously was incredibly sad um, time to be a journalist. I was on maternity leave with my daughter who's now probably your guys' age. Um, and I remember that I was working, well, I was on maternity leave until December. And then when I went back to the newsroom, I was working nights so I could be with my daughter during the day. And I had really happy times playing with a baby from like nine to seven. And then I'd go to work from seven till 2 a.m. So I had a balance. That's what kept me sane. Um, and every once in a while, like some editor would come over and say like, hey, do you want to write about a candy company in Brooklyn? And I'm like, yes, you know, let me write something other than tragic memories of people who were killed too soon. Um, I did have, I do remember like, and this happens, like sometimes I'll be writing about sad things for a long period of time, including the Covenant House book. And then one little thing will just hit me off, set me off and I'll have a good crying fit. Um, so that happened with the Covenant House book too, because those were sad stories that I was, I have pretty good calluses built up so that I don't lose my mind over the sadness that I'm taking in. But like if the wrong song starts playing on the radio and it's been several months of sadness, then I'll just have, it's like, I'll just have a good crying fit and feel better. Um, so, you know, <clears throat> sorry to interrupt, but, um, one of the things about, you know, the assignment for the class about how it can strengthen your writing, it's not necessarily you're writing in academic situations. It's writing anything. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that we've talked about and they've read about are the therapeutic effects of writing. Guy James Pennebaker, from, he's from the University of Texas. I don't know if you're familiar with his stuff at all, but he's, he's kind of like the academic guru about all the science that shows that writing about trauma actually has effects on like your immune system, positive effects. Yeah. So would you in, endorse that for my students? To yeah, write yeah, yeah for sure. Well, like um, journaling it has been shown to, did I say this already? To this class? <laughs> hey, welcome to the teaching club. It's like, I'm always saying to them, did I tell you this story? And they're like, we don't know. We don't, we don't pay attention to you. So then I can tell it. Um, about diabetes? No. Okay. No, the, um, I've kept a journal since I was 14 just to practice sentence writing. I mean, I kept it because at a certain point, I just didn't want to stop after I would gotten so much momentum going and it's, it makes me happy. So, but I've read studies that show that if you journal about your, you know, even about a health condition for only 20 minutes a week, the people who do that compared to a control group have better health outcomes at the end their numbers improve in the, if they're diabetic or if they have um, COPD, I think was the other um, condition, but there, there was, it was scientifically proven that journaling about whatever it is that ails you helps. 
And whether that's like just the common up and downs of mood or anxiety or what have you, um, practicing writing is, is, is good for your health. It gets, it keeps you, it gets rid of a certain level of repression. If you see it on the page, it's real. It makes your concerns real, but it also sort of takes some of the emotional charge out of them. And I find like in the course of a day, if somebody's pissed me off, I'll probably go and write a paragraph in my journal and then go back to my usual program, you know, just, just to get it out there and feel like I've processed it a bit and processing your emotions is, is good for you. So yeah, I mean, the kind of writing that you folks can get better at includes letter writing or, or journal writing or essays or, you know, if you're a blogger, all of that, even if it's a business letter, writing well is a very valued and rare skill in, in our society. And I'm always amazed by, you know, kind of the, the lack of good writing out there. So if you're paying attention in John's class and practicing and working on getting better, it's very possible to, to get better over time. Yeah, and just to reinforce that, you know, one of the pieces I have a look at by Peter Elbow, who said that for him, free writing, which means writing without stopping and thinking nobody else is going to read it, for him, that's the best way to improve your writing. Yeah, yeah. So. And you can get good good snippets out of it that way. Mm -hmm. If you go back and reread it, you probably have a couple gems in there. Yeah. So we're coming sort of toward near the end, amazingly. This, goes, this always goes by really quickly for me, boy. Me too. Yeah. I'm trying to see if I got, I got writer's block. Yeah, I think I got at least one from everybody. That was my hope. If you didn't have a question answered and you have one, pop it in the chat. Well, we have a little time left, like what, four minutes? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> or you can just sp speak up. Got yeah. It. So um, now Tana, but I just have to, let me let me just say really quickly, Lay Layla is here. I don't know if I sent you this. Layla lives in Maplewood. Oh. And works at the Abel Baker. And she also started her own business slash website. Layla, could you tell Tina a little bit about it? If you can hear me. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I live, I live in Maplewood and um, my business is called Protect Minorities. I sell t-shirts that like say protect black women, protect black men. And um, it's to like spread awareness on like the treatment of minorities um, in different parts of like the world and stuff. And I um, raise money to donate as well awesome i've seen those t-shirts oh think, really do you do you play on facebook at all or where have i seen those yeah like i have instagram oh, they fit on facebook people wear them in town sometimes great yeah congratulations are you do you, you do you. do you do um blogging about that or do you do you use your writing in per pursuing your business um no, I have a website, but I don't blog. I mean, I can definitely look into it though. Yeah. I mean, it helps. I mean, from a business angle, I know the more material you have out there that you can push, maybe you don't have a new shirt design in a week, but you might have a new blog post or a, a new reflection on something in the news um, about the topic and the need for protection. There's there's usually something in the news every day on that. Um, yeah. It's it's a it, it could help you um, practice writing and also advance your um, your business. But good luck. Thank you. Thanks. Um, you know, I, I went I went to the Abel Baker and I, you know, Julie was there and I said, oh, my student works here. And Julie said, look, this is her shirt. And she was wearing uh, a shirt said, what, I can't remember, was it protect black women? Um, but I took a picture of her. Yes. So. Awesome. Um, MM is asking where, or Miriam, Miriam is asking, the moment I decided to become a writer, um, I gotta say it was probably second grade. Um, I've been very blessed by knowing what I wanted to be when I grew up for quite a long time. And I had a teacher who showed us a slideshow, probably given how old I am, um, on a guy who wrote, Walt Kelly, who wrote Pogo's 
swamp or pogo it was a mm -hmm. strip pogo's it was about these little creatures who lived in the woods and i wrote a short story about it and my teacher made a big fuss about it and i often wonder if she made a big fuss about my artwork if i would have just decided to turn into an artist because i love this teacher so much um but i thought it was really cool to be able to write stories like this guy did in his um pogo's forest so that was probably the moment back and I don't even want to say how long ago that was, but definitely 50 years ago. And then M with just one M in the chat. So that doesn't help me too much. Three different ways to help us with our college essays. Some advice. Um, read, be nice to yourself. Or maybe it was Michael. Yeah. Read a lot, write a lot, and be nice to yourself in the process. So... Get rid of the voice that tells you that this is garbage and you don't know what you're doing because you do. And the more you read, especially reading stuff, people you care about and admire and people you want to write like. So like, I love reading Dan Barry because he's so good. Um, I love reading, I have a theologian that I love to read because I love the clarity of his thought. The more you read, who you want to be like, the more you sort of inherit those brain patterns and what? get to thinking that way. What's the name of that theologian? Um, John Spong, John Shelby Spong, who was the Episcopal Bishop of Newark and who ordained the first gay priests in Maplewood. How do you spell, spell his last name? Um, it's like sponge without the E, Spong. S-P-O-N-G, okay. And he passed away recently, <laughs> a couple months ago, but um, was brilliant and such a clean thinker and so good at explaining really difficult. I mean, he basically, he wrote why, why Christianity Must Change or Die and basically cuts down so much of the myth stuff in religion and brings us back to additional or to original principles. And... Um, Someone's asking, do I, oh, it's probably Miriam again. Do I ever have doubts about my writing? Holy Lord, yes, every day, every day I get, I do the terrible thing of looking at people who have books out that I'm jealous of and thinking like, oh, why am I not the person who did that book? And, oh, you know, that's, it depends. If I've gone running, I'm much more confident Somehow, I just am less likely to mope about about other people's successes, and um, but I do compare myself to other people too much. And what is it? There's a couple quotes on that. Um, Comparison is the theft of joy, is the thief of joy. Um, compare and despair. It really doesn't matter what other people are doing. You just have to focus on what you're you're doing yourself, and also some of the famous writers that I think I wish I were more like are also pretty miserable people who are supposedly all the famous poets are, are actually pretty miserable people that you wouldn't want to trade places with. So that's a bit of a comfort. Right. <laughs> well, on that happy note, yeah, I, you know, I was just saying, quoting Oscar Wilde, be yourself, everyone else is taken. Right. You know, so... Anyway, but thank you very much. Well, and thank can you, you guys. guys. Can you guys all thank, can you turn on your mics and say thank you to this woman here? <laughs> Took time out of her day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good yeah. luck with everything. So, all right, Tina, thank you very much. Take care, see you soon. Be in touch. Okay, take care. Bye. Bye. So for you guys, while who are still here, um, it's 2.18. I'm good. Let me stop the recording actually first. Amazing. So yes, stopping the recording.